that there is so many that Christ remains to our fellows to his servants. So that's this uh, well this week we're all on the new sheet, I don't think there's any time to hire for the sick rest in the last minute. Thank you. 
the one whom God has chosen to possess all things at the end. He reflects the brightness of God's glory and is the exact likeness of God's own being, sustaining the universe with his powerful word. After achieving forgiveness for human sins, he sat down in heaven at the right-hand side of God, the supreme power. The Son was made greater than the angels, just as the name that God gave him is greater than theirs. God has not placed the angels as rulers over the new world to come, the world of which we speak. Instead, as it is said somewhere in the scriptures, What are human beings, O God, that you should think of them? Mere human beings, that you should care for them. You made them for a little while lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honour, and made them rulers of all things. It says that God made them rulers over all things. This clearly includes everything. We do not, however, see human beings ruling over all things now. But we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, so that through God's grace he should die for everyone. We see him now crowned with glory and honour because of the death he suffered. It was only right that God, who creates and preserves all things, should make Jesus perfect through suffering in order to bring many children to share his glory. For Jesus is the one who leads them to salvation. He purifies people from their sins, and both he and those who are made pure all have the same Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his family. He says to God, I will tell my people what you have done. I will praise you in their meeting. This is the word of the Lord. This reading is taken from St Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, beginning at verse 2. Some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, 
Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, by your Holy Spirit, may my spoken word be faithful to the written word, and lead us to the living word, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, no matter how broad-minded we think we are, we often ignore uh, opinions that uh, we don't like. And two recent uh, phenomena illustrate this quite well. First is that phrase you may have heard um, of echo chambers, uh, the idea that we uh, tend to listen only uh, to the things that we agree with. Uh, this is particularly true in a, in a time where there is so much variety, uh, so many different sources we can get uh, information from. We tend to gravitate towards the ones that we agree with. And sometimes this uh, can be unintentional when uh, we use social media, the uh, computer algorithms work out the kind of things that we like and then uh, show us more of it, which is why if you've ever uh, searched for, to buy something on the internet, after you've bought it you get hundreds and hundreds of adverts telling you that you can buy it again. So we live in these kind of echo chambers where we only hear opinions uh, that we agree with and therefore we can assume that whatever we think, everyone else in the world thinks, uh, and we don't hear other opinions. The second phenomena is a cancel culture, uh, a culture that uh, doesn't deal very well with opinions that differ, can't do discussion uh, and arguments in a civilised way. Instead, when it hears opinions it doesn't like, it simply silences them, and doesn't allow them to speak. The kind of culture we live in uh, of echo chambers and council culture. But what do we do when those opinions that make us feel uncomfortable, uh, that we would want to shy away from, what happens when those opinions come from Jesus? It's hard enough uh, if you just think that Jesus is simply a wise teacher uh, we find it hard sometimes when we find people that we like and agree with uh, when they suddenly say something that we don't agree with. Uh, I was listening to a podcast uh, this week about uh, someone who spends a lot of their life uh, thinking about and writing about C.S. Lewis and all the wonderful things uh, and the wonderful ways that he explained the Christian faith. But he admitted uh, that he sometimes, when he reads C.S. Lewis's uh, opinions on certain things, he has to admit uh, that C.S. Lewis was just wrong on some things. How do we do it uh, if it is Jesus that we hear an opinion of that we don't really like? It's hard enough if we just see him as a, a normal, wise teacher. But we've had that amazing reading from the letter to the Hebrews, that talks about the fact that God has spoken through the prophets, but now he has spoken to us through the Son, the Son who is an exact representation of him, the Son who has all power and authority in the world. What happens when it's Jesus that is giving us those opinions that we don't like? You're right, Lily. So we could, uh, when we come across those opinions that we don't, uh, that make us feel comfortable that Jesus says, we could just dismiss them. We could say that he didn't know, really know what he was talking about, or perhaps that he was a product of his own time and his own culture, and that if he lived today he would say something different. But we can't really do that and still claim to be followers of Jesus. If we are to be followers of Jesus, we need to take everything that he says seriously 
and we need to take everything he says as being what God says. Today, Jesus' teaching in today's Gospel reading is one of those really difficult passages. Jesus talks about divorce and marriage, and he speaks about them in very clear terms. There is no getting round what Jesus says in this passage about divorce and remarriage. But also this passage uh, has another uh, thing that offends people these days that it probably wouldn't in the days that Jesus said it. Jesus says, God in creation makes us male and female. There is no other options. God makes us male and female. And Jesus says that marriage, similarly, is between male and female and none other. So these words that Jesus speaks in our Gospel today are words that many people in our society would not want to listen to, would want to cancel and would want to silence. And for us too, they might make us feel rather uncomfortable. But as they are the words of Jesus, who is the exact representation of God, uh, let's just spend a little while this morning opening our ears to what he might say to us today through these words. When it comes to moral and ethical issues, um, we need uh, to remember that we are often facing real life situations that affect real people. We can't really discuss uh, issues about marriage and divorce uh, in a kind of vacuum, in an abstract way. They affect people and people's lives, and we probably know people that these issues have affected. So we always need to remember that these uh, issues are not just abstract, but they affect real life. And this was also true uh, for Jesus when he was asked this question. As we look at the context of uh, where Jesus was, Jesus was in the very place that John the Baptist was uh, centred his ministry. Um, Jesus was speaking in that place. And we remember uh, that John the Baptist uh, came uh, to his end because he was preaching about Herod uh, the king and saying how it wasn't right that he married Herodias, who was his brother Philip's wife. It wasn't right that Herodias had divorced his, her husband Philip in order to marry Herod. That was, in the end, what made uh, Herodias plot to kill John the Baptist. It was why Herod put him in prison. So when the Pharisees come to ask Jesus in that place about his opinions on marriage and divorce, it's not an abstract discussion. This is a trap. The Pharisees are trying to get Jesus to do the same thing that John the Baptist did and uh, therefore to suffer the same uh, end as John the Baptist did. Herod put John the Baptist to death because he didn't like the opinions that John the Baptist was preaching. The Pharisees hoped the same would be true of Herod and Jesus. So the Pharisees come to Jesus with this trap, trying to get him to do the same thing that John the Baptist did. But Jesus sees through the trap and he answers them in two ways. He put, firstly, points them towards God's original plan and secondly he points out the root cause of the problem. So Jesus talks about God's original plan and his teaching here on marriage is clear and unequivocal. Marriage is between a man and a woman who are unified by God. They no longer uh, are two people, they become one flesh. And Jesus uh, bases this by uh, turning uh, the Pharisees' attentions not to Jesus' teaching but to Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, where God uh, institutes marriage with Adam and Eve 
male and female being joined together in one flesh. Marriage is not just a marriage, uh, a partnership of convenience. It's not something like Herodias did uh, to marry to get power and influence. Marriage is about two people becoming one flesh. And as Jesus directs uh, the Pharisees back towards that creation account, they will also notice something else. Not only do the two become one flesh, uh, but also in becoming one flesh, they in some way become the image of God. We are told in Genesis that God makes all humanity in the image of himself. But there's something also about the marriage of male and female, which also uh, imitates and uh, produces the image of God. So Jesus points the Pharisees back to that original plan of God for marriage, male and female united in one flesh. And so Jesus says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This is what marriage is, and this is what marriage should be. Jesus points us back to Genesis, to the original plan of God. So what has gone wrong? Why does divorce then become an issue if this is what marriage is? Well, Jesus points us to the root cause of the problem. He says to the Pharisees uh, that Moses allowed them uh, to have divorce because of your hardness of heart. He points uh, to the uh, permission that Moses gives for people to divorce, but says that the cause of it is hard-heartedness. Moses recognised um, that relationships were breaking down and the divorce needed to be regulated uh, in order to prevent abuse, to prevent women being just abandoned by men. And we know from rabbinic tradition around this time that a man could divorce a woman uh, simply for getting his dinner wrong. So women uh, could be abandoned by their husbands, uh, they could be uh, left without any financial support, or perhaps uh, the husband might retur resort uh, to murder in order to get out of the marriage. Mo Moses recognised that in order to prevent uh, these things happening, uh, divorce should be regulated and uh, there should be rules around it. So that's what Moses recognised as being uh, the response to that brokenness uh, in relationships. But Jesus reminds us that marriage as God intended, that male and female union uh, into one flesh, is not unrealistic. But the problem is our hard-heartedness. The problem is human sinfulness. Sinfulness that leads to the breakdown of relationships and sinfulness that makes that kind of legal settlement uh, a necessity. So Jesus points uh, us beyond that cause of the problem, that sinfulness, back to God's original plan. But as we see Jesus' teaching, um, it can seem to be harsh uh, and in some ways some people might call it unchristian. And indeed uh, it would be if Jesus is saying that humans are sinful and therefore relationships will break down, but divorce itself is wrong. If Jesus is saying we are sinful uh, but divorce is wrong, uh, then that would be harsh and cruel and unchristian. It's no good just to point out the problem, particularly if there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do about the fact that we are sinful. No matter how hard we try in all of our relationships, not just in marriage, no matter how hard we try, we will always let people down. Uh, we will always do things to hurt other people. So it's no good for Jesus just to point out that problem. If 
he is arguing for a return to marriage as God, un uh, as understood by Genesis, as God teaches us. He is either hopelessly unrealistic uh, or he is offering us a cure for that problem of hard heartedness. And it is this second that Jesus is doing. He points us to the problem of our hard heartedness because he is also pointing us to the cure as well. We're reminded uh, in Hebrews uh, that through his death, Jesus provides a way for us to be forgiven and that Jesus is the one who sanctifies us uh, with his Holy Spirit. Jesus offers us a way for sins to be forgiven and as the prophets uh, said in the Old Testament, through his gift of the Holy Spirit, our hearts of stone can be replaced by hearts of flesh. That uh, the law of the Lord will be written on our hearts and that our hearts will be inclined to keep his law. This is the remedy that Jesus is offering us for our hard heartedness. He's pointing us to the problem because he also wants to point us to the cure through his death and through his resurrection. But this doesn't automatically fix everything. As we come to God for forgiveness, we also need to cooperate with his spirit. But the more a husband and wife are guided by the Holy Spirit, the less likely there will be a need for divorce. And what is true uh, for marriage relationships is also true for all of our human relationships. The more we are guided uh, by the Holy Spirit in our lives, the less uh, we will uh, break down relationships with other people. By placing uh, Jesus' blessing of the children right after this teaching on marriage, Mark reminds us of a very important point that is often overlooked uh, when we think about marriage and divorce. That divorce and uh, relationship breakdown has really negative effects on children. And so often in these situations, the children suffer so that the adults can be happy. Jesus uh, turns that idea upside down. He takes the children, welcomes them, and protects them and he wants us to do the same but Jesus makes another point as he welcomes the children that we need to receive the kingdom of God like little children and this again is the cure for hard-heartedness children in those days were seen as powerless and dependent and of no value as we recognize our own sinfulness and our own powerlessness to do anything about it. We are dependent upon God for forgiveness and we are dependent on his Holy Spirit. If we do this, we cannot be hard-hearted. If we are asking forgiveness for our sins, recognising our dependence on God and being filled with the Holy Spirit, that problem of hard-heartedness will reduce as our hearts are gradually softened and conformed uh, to God's image and likeness. So in our passage this morning, uh, difficult though it is, Jesus points us to the root cause of divorce and relationship breakdown and everything else which distorts God's original plan for us, the root cause being our own sinfulness. But he doesn't just point the finger, he offers us the cure. Through his death we have forgiveness. Through his resurrection we can become new creations guided by the Holy Spirit. Here is strength for those who struggle. Here is good news for all of us who fail to live up to God's original plan. Let us receive this like little children with nothing to offer in return and in doing so we will feel Jesus' embrace and his blessing on us 
as his little children. Let's stand to say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you like to be seated? So we've been made aware of our need for a saviour, so let's turn to Jesus as we say together, the saviour of the world. Jesus, saviour of the world, come to us in your mercy. We look to you to save and help us. By your cross and your life laid down, you set your people free. We look to you to save and help us. When they were ready to perish, you saved your disciples. We look to you to come to our help. In the greatness of your mercy, loose us from our chains. Forgive the sins of all your people. Make yourself known as our Saviour and mighty Deliverer. Save and help us that we may praise you. Come now and dwell with us, Lord Christ Jesus. Hear our prayer and be with us always. And when you come in your glory, Make us to be one with you and to share the life of your kingdom. We're going to stand and sing our next hymn, number 261 in the Brown Books, There is a Redeemer. Let's stand.
Let me say it again. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the Queen. And teach her counsel of wisdom. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. And let your servants shout for joy. O Lord, make your ways known upon earth. Let all nations acknowledge your saving power. Give your people the blessing of peace. And let your glory be Make our hearts clean, O God. And renew a right spirit within us. Heavenly Father, we pray to you this morning. We pray for the church that our doubts and fears are reassured and we are encouraged to be charitable, true Christians and to be compassionate with our contemporaries. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Dear God, bless our Queen and give her faith and strength to continue to rule in good health and give our government the know-how to help solve the many problems that face us. Help the helpless and innocent that are caught up in the brutality and hatred that exists in our fragmented world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our own community. We confess our own failings and lack of compassion and love. We thank you that you forgive our failings and we ask you to graciously give us a spirit of love and forgiveness that sees only the good in each other, that bears no grudges and forgives all grievances. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our we pray for our family and friends who give us support and encourage us, listen to us, makes us laugh and share our sorrows, bless their lives and give them joy. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for the sick and weary and those who feel lost and unloved. Help them to overcome their infirmities and pain. Namely, Gary Williams, Malcolm White, Keith Portis, Pauline Gainsborough, Teresa Harrison, Oakley Stackholmis, Jean Smith, Ian Moss, Keith Roberts, Irene Wilson, Lisa Pendleton, Janet Anderton, Colin and Irene Betterton and Deb Longsdale. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Dear God, we pray for the bereaved. Namely, Neil Brompton, Janice Owen, John McKeddy, Nigel Jana. God bless their souls. Let them be at peace and help their families and loved ones to overcome their grief. Give them faith and strength to overcome their loss. We ask for the healing only God can give. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, everlasting God. We pray for ourselves as we go from this church today to start the week ahead. We ask that in all we do, we may walk more closely with you at our side. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all our blessings and pray that we take none of them for granted, but commit ourselves to live out our thanks each day. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
the collect for today, the 18th Sunday after Trinity. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to that which is before, we may run the way of your commandments and win the crown of everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, to serve you is perfect freedom, defend us, your servants, from all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's say the next prayer together. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you that you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger. Order us in all our doings and guide us to do always what is right in your eyes. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time, with one accord, to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of your servants, as may be most expedient for, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the world to come, everlasting life. Amen. Amen. So rejoicing in the presence of God here among us, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So may God, who has called us out of darkness into his marvellous light, bless us and fill us with peace. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to end with our final hymn, number 83 in the Brown Books. God is working his purpose out. Let's stand. Yeah.